Well, hello, everyone, and, well, and a very warm welcome to our first panel discussion of the Euromoney Covered Bond Congress 2020, uh, Capital and Funding Needs of a Post-COVID Banking System. Thank you all for tuning in and joining us. Um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, the discussion, and we'll meet the panellists in just a second. Uh, but for you, the audience out there, this is a reminder that you have the opportunity to put questions to our panellists via the Q&A box that you should see on screen and that after the panel we'll attempt to answer those questions. Um, so uh, to, let's, to, to get things started, let, let's meet our panellists um, and let's start with Lucette. Good morning everybody and thank you for joining the Your Money um, conference. I'm Lucette Iverno, I'm currently leading the systematic franchise at uh, Fidelity International. I've been investing in covered bond for many years and um, I think it suits um, greatly a um, number of my clients, noticeably pension plan and insurance um, clients for my asset management business. Thank you. Patrick? Yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Patrick Steek. I'm heading the asset liability management at LBW that comprises, uh, besides funds transfer pricing, also funding and investor relations, uh, but also the liquidity portfolio with the focus of uh, the LCR steering. Um, and there we also invest in covered bonds and SSA paper. Thank you, Antonio. Good morning, um, Antonio Farina, um, credit analyst in the covered bond team at SP Global Ratings. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, Marco. Morning, everyone. So I'm Marco Nikolic, and I had a, a Northern European. Uh, desk at Nomura, um, focusing predominantly on financial institutions, uh, speaking to the bank treasuries, and obviously covered bonds being a, a, a key tool um, for the banks. Um, it's it's obviously important that actually we cover that topic on uh, today. Thank you very much. Uh, now, just to quickly set the scene, and I'm sure our panelists will agree, it's been a year like no other. Um, there were genuine fears about the health of the banking sector at the height of the coronavirus crisis in March. Experts wondered whether the economic cost of the dealing with the pandemic might force some lenders into breaching the solvency triggers built into their capital instruments. But any resulting uh, panic in the financial markets was quickly solved as policymakers rolled out various measures of capital relief for the industry. They firmly declared that banks were part of the solution to the crisis rather than part of the problem. For the best part of the last five months, financial institutions have had ready access to the debt capital markets across a range of asset classes. The need for pure funding has all but disappeared, with central banks offering lenders vast sums of cheap cash. Many banks have therefore used the opportunity to build up more capital adequacy or increase their loss-absorbing capacity. Treasury teams are now keen to make headway on their issuance plans for 2021 as soon as possible. Uh, and market participants, I think, are broadly confident that banks will remain resilient and will carry on benefiting from support from uh, official institutions. But the pandemic, I think, has created a sense of anxiety about the risk of further dislocation in the capital markets ahead of a tricky period for global politics and for COVID-19 case numbers. Meanwhile, as I discussed with Bodewin uh, Dirk, ECBC Deputy Chairman earlier, the expected huge increase in SSA and Govy bond issuance will surely have an impact on the covered bond market. So, um, Antonio, starting with you, from your perspective, um, how do you see the covered bond market changing in response to this uh, huge SSA and Govy bond issuance supply? Thanks. Uh, let's say that uh, from uh, a, a rating perspective to, to start with, uh, the, the risk is that a uh, huge increase in, in darkness uh, may trigger a, a wave of downgrades in uh, uh, sovereign ratings, which in turn uh, could impair the credit worthness of uh, the, the covered bonds. And indeed, we are looking at and uh, expecting a huge increase in uh, government debt. In the Eurozone alone, we expect an increase uh, in the area of uh, around 15% over uh, GDP by, by the end of uh, 2020. However, we also note that uh, um, our uh, sovereign uh, colleagues have uh, reviewed already all the major uh, ratings on uh, European sovereign, and they didn't uh, uh, downgrade uh, any of them. And uh, um, there are uh, good reasons for, for that. Um, the, the, the main one is that 
that uh, we believe that uh, economic resilience and, and the monetary flexibility at this stage are more important than a one year increase in uh, um, sovereign debt. Therefore, uh, uh, they, they have maintained the rating and we also note that uh, most of the outlook on uh, European sovereign are uh, stable with the exception of uh, Italy and Slovakia that are uh, uh, negative on negative outlook. Looking for uh, looking at the, the, the future, uh, um, a very important role will be played by the evolution of the, the pandemic um, in order to uh, create our uh, economic and credit forecast, uh, we need to make some assumption on the evolution of the pandemic and currently we factor in uh, that uh, by the second half of 2021, either a treatment or a vaccination will be widely available. So if this is the case, uh, we expect a uh, quite stable rating. If uh, condition turn out to be uh, more negative, then we could uh, see some pressure on sovereign rating, which in turn may put uh, pressure on, on certain covered bond rating especially in uh, Italy, Greece, uh, Spain, Ireland, and to a lesser extent, and especially for the public sector, Belgium, France, and uh, um, UK. Thank you. Uh, how about you, Marco? Um, how do you expect the covered bond market to react to this increase in issuance elsewhere? So it's it's a bit of a, a, a weird sort of background if you if you want. Um, there's actually so much cash that's been injected into the into the system. The whole system is actually financial system is actually flush with uh, with liquidity. Um, so it's uh, a um, allowing investors to actually start looking at the range of asset classes to what uh, as to as to which ones they want to buy. Um, but secondly, also giving actually a, a certain degree of confidence as to what they should and could be buying. So. Um, if you think about uh, um, SSA supply that we've seen as, uh, as a result of COVID especially, um, uh, investors are actually uh, keen. I mean, given the sort of cheap sources of liquidity, they actually are keen to actually buy, uh, buy whatever is actually thrown at them, um, which actually makes the covered bonds uh, uh, pretty attractive um, in comparison. So um, covered bonds could actually be the, the next sort of uh, point for, for investors to actually start looking at. Um, I mean, we have an investor on the panel, so I'll let, I'll let her opine on that front. But having said that, now looking at this sort of a supply and demand dynamic, at the same time, um, uh, SSA issuance is actually supporting some of the channels and some of the tools that governments have actually chosen um, uh, to, to, to inject the liquidity into the system, which means that actually banks and the issuers of covered bonds probably have less needs to issue covered bonds because they've got other sources of, of, of just as cheap uh, liquidity. So it's a bit of a weird dynamic, but I mean, we are already actually seeing sort of positive trends in the recent, uh, in the recent months. Uh, covered bond spreads have actually tightened quite a bit. So um, where do we stop with this? Um, big question mark and see how, how the markets actually pan out over the coming months. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so Lucette, um, um, how do you feel about it all? Well, I think um, the covered bond uh, carry on servicing a special need in uh, many investor portfolio, which um, has been reiterated um, uh, during the pandemic. And this is solid investment with um, very little um, spread volatility. And I think it has demonstrated once again during something that um, was um, mostly um, unforeseen. But uh, this asset class has been um, extremely robust and very little flow or outflow has been taken out of the asset class. I think um, going forward, um, I don't expect necessarily um, a large um, wave of issuance because I think the, the number of mortgages which have been secured upon covered bond has not um, increased very greatly during uh, the pandemic. Maybe um, a few have had um, some special circumstances and have been supported by local um, government and um, also central bank plan to support uh, mortgage repayment um, in the adverse condition that um, some citizen would have lost their job. But again, I think the market has uh, behaved incredibly well and I'm very, very um, um, looking forward to um, you know what comes um, next in this um, obviously still uncertain environment. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so Patrick, we haven't heard from you yet. Um, same question. So perhaps uh, expanding it a little bit broader than just cover bonds and in general bank finance in, in general. Um, how, do you, how do you think um, 
Um, this big increase in SSA issuance later on in the year and will impact those markets. I mean, I, I uh, totally agree with Antonio and, and Marco. I mean, we look at the color book market from two perspectives. So first of all, uh, from an issuance perspective and uh, covered bonds or German fund brief in our case um, um, still uh, will be a very important uh, a funding instrument uh, for LGW uh, now and for the future. So uh, um, the, the future uh, SSA Gavi supply does not change anything because uh, from a uh, from a funding point of view, it is um, let's say one central uh, instrument uh, we we will use uh, in the future as well. Maybe that may have some implication in terms of pricing. We saw that uh, recently uh, when we issued our six-year uh, public sector covered bond, there was a pricing floor where um, Deutsche Bundesländer, so German uh, federal state issuance um, uh, made the floor and you couldn't go through it. Uh, I think that is something uh, issuers have to cope with that, uh, let's say there is, let's say some, let's call it uh, competition, uh, uh, but uh, I think the only influence from, a, from an issuance point of view is, is let's say, the, 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 the all in pricing. Yeah? But um, uh, from a planning point of view, and Nico, uh, Marco uh, already said it, there are other uh, cheap sources of funding that is true mm. but that uh, uh, tlto i think we will talk about it in detail uh, later does not really solve all uh, challenges of banks uh, it's uh, liquidity is not equal liquidity from a from an lm uh, point of view um, um, you have to uh, cope with much more uh, let's say complex uh, uh, planning uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, milestones. First of all, uh, you have to fulfill the regulatory requirements such as EMBREL, then uh, for certain rating agencies, you have to fulfill certain, um, let's say, minimum subordination um, uh, ratios um, uh, like the LGF, for instance, from, from Moody's, etc. So that uh, defines one part of the, of the funding instrument, which is Sino non preferred AQ1 uh, uh, and uh, tier two. Um, and then the tier two, oh, as it is uh, right now, is, is kept at three years. So balance sheets of banks are mostly longer than three years. So you have to cope with the funding mismatch. Yeah? Um, so it's cheap liquidity and it is uh, definitely, uh, let's say, um, too. Um, too interesting uh, as to ignore uh, the TLGO, oh, that, that, that's for sure, but it's, uh, let's say, equal uh, senior preferred funding. Yeah? And uh, we use the covered bond as an instrument to achieve, uh, let's, say, uh, uh, let's say, the optimization of the funding costs for longer terms um, uh, that goes beyond uh, that go beyond uh, the three-year maturity of, of TLGO. So, as I said, um, you have to uh, manage the, um, let's say, a, a, a potential duration mismatch that is caused by the TLGO kept at three years. So we use fund brief uh, as the next ch cheapest funding instrument uh, for longer term. And, uh, and then uh, you have to fulfill also uh, um, let's say regulatory and uh, requirements and requirements from uh, from individual rating agencies that let's say uh, result in the funding mix that um, you know that is this is more complex than uh, one one could think of. But uh, as I said, uh, fund briefer and cover bonds are a very very important funding instrument. And we saw that, uh, uh, especially in the last uh, couple of months, that the retracement uh, was extremely um, uh, quick. Of, of course, uh, uh, thanks to the measures you, you said in the, intro, in the introduction. Uh, but uh, if we look back at the last decades, they have always been, um, let's say, a reliable funding instrument uh, in, in, in terms of, of, of crisis or challenging uh, times. So this is a perspective from a from a funding uh, point of view. If I, uh, I look at the look at uh, our investment books, uh, we are very well diversified uh, with with let's say 
um, uh, edge aid paper around the globe in different uh, currencies and and uncovered uh, ones also there play uh, let's say the, the major uh, part uh, or uh, the major part of, of our portfolios uh, in terms of diversification of course uh, we add also ssas uh, i wouldn't say um, the ssa part would uh, let's say grow um, uh, massively in the next in the next couple of months there is a supply i i, I do agree uh, but uh, we follow um, our, our diversification and uh, also, um, let's say, return targets uh, of, of that portfolio. And, and um, uh, we acknowledge um, the supply, but um, um, uh, we still uh, are very keen on, uh, uh, on, on cover bonds um, from, from various jurisdictions, and that will um, let's say last for the, the next year, so I, I, would, I would say. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, um, so on, on the sell side, uh, the biggest alternative to cover bonds is TLTRO, I think, as, you, as you said, Patrick, yeah. uh, and, and similar programs. Um, they, um, they seem to have abandoned the pretense of being emergency funding and are now just subsidized funding, arguably. So two questions, and maybe um, starting with Marco, um, is there still a stigma to taking TLTRO funding? And um, and also, what is the exit strategy from the program? Or is it too early to be talking about an exit strategy? Um, so uh, going to what, what Patrick was just saying, so TLTRO wouldn't exactly be um, a like-for-like -like alternative for the covered bonds, I mean, for the reasons that he, he expanded on uh, a minute ago, primarily um, when it comes to actually matching the, the duration of the assets uh, with, with liabilities. So TLTRO would actually be short term versus some of the covered bonds we're seeing Munich Hypo in the market today with a 15 year would actually be focusing more on the longer part of the curve. But that aside, um, is there a stigma attached to TLTRO? In short, absolutely not. It almost seems to have become the norm over time. So um, let's rewind back sort of 20, 30 years. We had the, the early 90s Nordic crisis, um, more recently uh, Lehman crisis. Now we have the COVID. Along the way, we obviously had some uh, uh, bumps along the road. So, it's almost, you're getting the impression that it's almost a question of time when we're going to get uh, the next crisis, uh, not if we're going to get the next crisis. So as such, um, fortunately or unfortunately, um, I think we have all learned certain lessons from all these crises, and we've learned, uh, or the governments and the regulators have come up with all sorts of tools um, as to how to actually help the banks, help the financial system, and ultimately boost uh, the economy. So TLTRO being one of those, um, absolutely uh, should be used. It's there what it's, uh, you know, it's there to be used. Um, whether we talk about TLTRO or bad banks or the covered bond purchase programs or the government guaranteed schemes, they're all there to actually reduce the cost of funding and kind of boost the liquidity in, in these sort of times. So um, in short, no, it's there to be used. Banks should be using it in these sort of times, especially uh, when it comes to discussing the, the net interest margins and uh, you know lack of growth and the pressure on the net interest margins will actually put further pressure on the on the on the banks to actually look for the cheapest sources of uh, of liquidity. Um, as far as exit is concerned, I think. As I mentioned, I think it's actually crisis after crisis after crisis. So actually, uh, we may be exiting this particular sort of program, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if actually we come up with yet another program for yet another crisis to come. So so it'll be a permanent feature of, of European finance, do you think? Well, permanent may be a bit of a, a hard word, but um, I, I don't see uh, all these measures being switched off overnight, certainly not uh, short to medium term. So I see it actually sticking around for quite some time. Okay. Uh, Lucette, what do you think about that? Well, I think we are um, currently borrowing multiple generation of retirement and saving to obviously save um, a pandemic, which we are facing and we don't know how to address given the uncertainty. Um, obviously, uncertainty is normally what market rave about because uncertainty gets priced in and out of the market and that creates uh, price fluctuation. Here, um, I do understand why the authority, the um, local government, and also the central bank have attempted as much as possible to remove this volatility. And 
also to remove as much as um, possible price fluctuation from a number of asset class because obviously that's also as we know um, through um, the bank uh, volatility that we've seen early 2011-2012 um, um, that's create also a lot of um, endangered species in the banking sector. So, um, so yes, um, I do understand why it's been done uh, this way. It, it's a considerable volume of money to be deployed to um, put uh, volatility at rest. Um, but um, is it enough? I don't know the answer just yet. Mm. Uh, okay, thank you. Um... So um, the ECB's purchase program dominates any discussion of, of relative or absolute value. Um, we've covered bond uh, purchases close to saturation points and plenty of new priorities for the ECB. Have we reached peak ECB involvement in the covered bond market? Um, and in future, should it change its modus operandi to reflect this, for example, by targeting more challenged credits, starting with you, Patrick? It's hard to say. I think. Um, um, I guess uh, a couple of years ago, we might have said we were already at peak ECB involvement, right? <laughs> um, um, we are at a new peak. I think the, the measures that have been uh, introduced uh, were very quick, and, um, um, and and the impact was 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 let's say with a very small, a little uh, time delay. It, it you know they worked. Yeah. And uh, I'm very sure, I'm pretty sure whether there is, let's say, another, um, let, let's say, uh, focus uh, in the crisis or upcoming crisis. I think central banks are uh, prepared and, and, and could, let's say, launch uh, further measures. So I, uh, so my, my guess is, uh, or my opinion is, that that's not the peak of, of central bank measures yet. Yeah? I think. Uh, yeah. Um, we all know um, uh, the, you know, the, the sentence uh, the former ECB president uh, said, "What, whatever it takes." And I think um, also uh, the, the the successor would 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 follow that path and, and, and let's say contribute to let's say um, um, yeah to, to to fight the crisis uh, with with further measures from central banks. So now, uh, oh yes. I think uh, there is no uh, peak yet uh, that, that, that may, we don't hope that, <laughs> that, uh, that, that let's say, the, the crisis uh, has, has a second wave, but um, I'm pretty sure there are measures that, that could be uh, now introduced to, uh, to fight the crisis again. Yeah. Uh, uh, Antonio, anything to add there? Well, it seemed to me that uh, over time, ADCB has been more careful in, in their intervention and uh, to make sure that uh, they are not as disruptive as they were at, at the very beginning. So I would uh, hope and think that uh, they will focus more on the purchase of other assets, such as uh, government bonds, and uh, will not have a lot of appetite to increase further their uh, presence in the covered bond market. Let's bear in mind that uh, they have already an increase in Credible amount of uh, of covered bond they own uh, around a, a third of the eligible assets. So it seems to me that uh, there will be certain uh, constraint for their uh, further increase in uh, presence of the covered bond market. Mm. You agree, Marco? Yes, uh, it is a very important tool um, to actually inject liquidity in the financial system. So um, to actually uh, say that we reached a peak and that we are unlikely to kind of expand it would be would be a bit too soon to tell, especially if you think about the covered space. Um, it is an evolving market. Uh, it's still relatively young uh, in, in the international terms. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised is actually with the evolution of the covered bond market that we actually see the ECB's response is actually kind of aligned, i.e. continue actually supporting it in some shape or form and actually continue actually loading up on the current position. Mm. Uh, Lucette, what are, what are your thoughts from where you said? Well, I think it's, it's quite um, important that the covered bond market gets um, extra support because I think it's um, one of the market that gets quite a lot of transparency in terms of supporting the citizen in the street with their mortgages, with um, pricing of um, new property purchases and so on. So I think it's quite a direct sponsorship 
in terms of supporting the local population. And I'm hoping that out of this pandemic, we have become a little bit more human and a little bit more social about um, supporting um, the market. And I think that's a, a very, very interesting point while we're supporting, um, you know, good, um, normal, two-way price um, and potentially even um, spread squeeze in the covered bond market. Okay, thank you. I'm just moving on a, a little bit. So the um, the EBA is telling banks uh, less capital, more lending, um, in contrast to the last crisis. Um, MPLs are presumably about to go through the roof and commercial property and perhaps house prices are going the other way. Um, why, why is no one talking about bank credit anymore? Lucette, um, back to you. Um. Well, that, that, that's a very um, good consultation, and uh, I'm not so sure the number are transparent yet because, um, as you know, most uh, follow scheme follow scheme sorry throughout um, Europe um, are still either in place or winding down um, extremely slowly. Um, commercial property um, obviously are being uh, renegotiated um, potentially at um, lower lower rent um, term. But quite a lot of them are still under previous contracts, which might have been um, signed or renewed towards the end of the year or early in the first quarter. So it's going to take some time to be um, more transparent. And um, hopefully we can um, we can look forward towards um, less impact of the pandemic in the second half of the year and some of the activity uh, being renewed. Um, more people returning to their office and potentially even new business being um, created. So um, it's necessarily um, shocking how many um, businesses have disappeared and are still in danger of disappearing um, following the economic um, disruption that uh, we've seen in the um, first and second quarter. But I think there's also this new wave of business coming online and um, hopefully it will um, support a new economy going forward and hopefully a greener economy as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Antonio, um, do you do you agree with my question that, um, you know, why is no one talking about bank credit anymore, given what's going on in the, in the real economy? Yeah, I, I think that uh, we, we should be talking more about that. Uh, and uh, the reason why this is not uh, on top of the agenda and the discussion uh, is related to what you have mentioned at the very beginning, that uh, there has been uh, extraordinary monetary and fiscal support uh, uh, on a timely fashion uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the crisis. And at the same time, we need to mention the fact that uh, European uh, lending institution enter into this crisis with a better uh, capital and liquidity buffer than uh, compared to the previous crisis. So, for example, uh, at S&P Globals, we have taken a, a number of uh, uh, action on, on and bank rating, but most of them, 90% of them, were uh, um, review in, in in the outlook rather than uh, outright uh, downgrade. We we downgraded around 10, only 10 percent of the rating action were uh, outright uh, downgrade and i think i also agree with Lucette uh, with the fact that uh, there is not a lot of transparency at the moment regarding uh, pool performance because uh, there are these uh, follow-on scheme and also payment holiday scheme and uh, the real test will be when uh, this uh, support measure will be uh, discontinued and um, so there is a question mark regarding the performance at the time when these are discontinued. There is also an important question mark regarding the, the, the timing for uh, for this process because uh, a number of these measures uh, have been uh, extended in a, in, in a number of uh, jurisdictions. Regarding uh, the impact on uh, cover bond rating, one thing to uh, mention is that uh, um, currently most of the cover bond uh, rating in the in, in Europe benefit from the so-called uh, unused notch. That is a measure of uh, the number of uh, notches of downgrade that the financial institution can suffer before we take a rating action on the uh, covered bond program. And then uh, regarding the collateral performance, uh, uh, we can say that at SP we are uh, fairly more positive on uh, the residential side. 
Again, because we think that uh, uh, temporary uh, work scheme, for example, have been very effective. We don't expect a very important increase uh, in uh, in unemployment rate. At the same time, we don't expect a crash in uh, house prices. What we will be looking at uh, um, is more uh, the, the, the CRE uh, uh, component uh, uh, and uh, especially retain and lodging. And there is also arguably a big question mark on um, Offices, but again, uh, if we look at the level of uh, over collateralization that's uh, currently covered bond benefit, we think there is a, a margin for uh, uh, pool performance to deteriorate before we take any rate in action on uh, rate cover bonds. Thank you. Um, just just looking at those EBA capital decisions in more detail, they imply that they're temporary uh, delays to the implementation of. The rules demanding more capital or MRL or IFRS 9 implementation uh, or cyclical. Um, is it a temporary change or, or has the pendulum swung back towards growth rather than stability? Uh, Marco and Patrick, So, um, okay. I, yeah, can you hear me? Um, so I would say actually we're not uh, we're not quite I okay. So I would say we're not quite in in neither the growth nor well we're probably closer to the stability phase than the growth. I think uh, uh, we are more in the in the capital preservation mode, if anything, for the time being. Um, regulators have been pretty reasonable in uh, in switching off counter cyclical buffers in some of the cases and uh, and delaying the implementation of uh, of mrel um as you as you said um but further refinements um are probably necessary to the basel four um especially when we're talking about the 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 output flows so um as far as the covid crisis most recently is uh, is concerned um, there's obviously a certain degree of uncertainty. So the key focus currently is, uh, as I said, on the capital conservation. Um, so all the banks are actually exerting a certain, a certain degree of prudence um, to ensure that there's sufficient cushion to absorb any sort of potential non-performing loans or credit impairments, um, especially, uh, to Antonio's point, as the government schemes uh, start to, to, to wean off or to roll off. So um, in, in this sort of crisis uh, of uncertainty times, um, it, it's not clear as to how swiftly the economies uh, will be able to recover. So um, I think conservatism is probably the key for the time being. Um, obviously, banks are seen as, as good cops in this particular scenario. So they're used as one of the channels to actually help out uh, governments uh, and all sorts of schemes that they actually had in mind. Um, so, so they're trying to be part of solving that problem rather than being the problem this time around. Um, so it seems that, okay, unclear, but um, uh, both the regulators and the banks seem to be actually uh, responding in a, in, in a mature and, and reasonable manner. Thank you. Uh, Patrick? Yeah, I mean, um, Marco's um, answer was very well, so uh, there's hard to add something. Uh, maybe, yeah, I, I don't think that um, the pendulum swung uh, back, um, uh, let's say, uh, I think it, it is a temporary, let's say, action in order to, to, to let's say, um, to, uh, you know, to help uh, to solve, let's say, this crisis as banks being, um, let's say, um, as, as you said, Marco, uh, you know, uh, part of the solution and not the problem. So you have to see the link between, let's say, the TLTO, uh, the special interest rate uh, period where uh, you have to, let's say, produce, uh, let's say, more lending. Um, um, and, and if you have a restriction on the other side in terms of RWA, it's, it's, it's simply not possible. So, so you have to, let's say, um, also, uh, you know, create incentives for bank uh, to grow and help to solve the solution. And I think that is a, a, this is a very logical, uh, uh, let's say, uh, way to, um, um, to, to, to incentivize um, uh, banks to, uh, to uh, now to, to do more lending. However, I don't think that banks will really um, um, you know, change their underwriting policy. I think it's still 
um, um, you know, most of the banks are, are following a very prudent underwriting uh, policy. So uh, capital is one of the restraints, but on the other hand, it's it's also credit risk. And I, that is uh, potentially one reason uh, that the banks are, um, despite the fact that there are very, you know, a lot of incentives um, to do more business, um, um, a little bit hesitant to go in every uh, sector currently. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so a defining factor of the covered bond market previously, in terms of ratings and pricings, was the predominance of national factors. So a weak bank in a strong country is better than a strong bank in a weak country. But the EU's response to the crisis is pushing the other way. The Bund BTP spread narrows with every announcement of a new facility. At the same time, the covered bond market, sorry, the covered bond directive um, is making covered bond regimes more similar. Are we uh, overstating the importance of national factors in covered bond markets nowadays, a Antonio? I, I think that uh, we don't uh, at, at this stage. Uh, we, we think that uh, um, sovereign consideration will still play a very important role uh, for, for the time being. It's still uh, much uh, safer to invest uh, in a cover bond issued out of a AAA rated country than a double B rated country. Now, uh, we would see this uh, um, if uh, we would expect a convergence in, in, in the sovereign rating. And uh, this is not the expectation yet. Obviously, the, the ECB intervention uh, has uh, supported uh, all the ratings on the, on the sovereign rating across the board. Um, and also, we have seen uh, with the, the EU recovery fund, an uh, uh, initial step towards uh, a debt uh, mutualization. And this, uh, in the long term, uh, may, may lead uh, to uh, a more homogeneous rating at the sovereign rating. However, uh, th this uh, the recovery fund can be a first step, but it can also be a, a last step. We we, we know that uh, there was an agreement, also forced by circumstances, but uh, a lot of people are opposed to um, credit and, and mutualization, and therefore uh, we we may find out that uh, there were there, there were no further process. Uh, improvement in, in, in from this point of view so i don't i don't think that at this stage uh, we can factor in a convergence in sovereign uh, in uh, sovereign rating uh, and this is also reflected by, by the fact that uh, most of our uh, sovereign rating have a stable outlook uh, as, as we speak regarding the the uh, cover bond harmonization um it's good initiative overall but uh, it's not a game changer in terms of a risk profile for cover bond uh, in, in 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 my opinion and and also, I would say that uh, at this stage, there is a question mark regarding uh, the timing for the approval. Uh, it seems that uh, 18 months in order to, to implement it uh, is now looking uh, optimistic. And if there are delays in the implementation, there is the risk that uh, certain aspects may be reopened, and this probably will not go towards uh, a further convergence. In my, in my view, if certain aspects of the harmonization directed are reopened are to give more flexibility to national authority to stick to their current uh, framework. Mm. Uh, Marco, same question to you. Um, are national factors in cover bond markets more important now or, or less important or becoming less important? I mean, uh, again, reflecting to what Antonio was uh, was saying earlier on, um, I, based on uh, market participants, especially when it comes to the larger investors uh, in the in the covered space, um, there was always actually a certain degree of of skepticism when it came to actually harmonisation across the board. Because, again, if you look at the fundamentals, uh, a cover pool of uh, an issuer from I don't know Northern Europe versus Southern Europe. Um, let's let's say they're both kind of mortgage uh, type of collaterals. Uh, they will behave in a different way. There will be different pressure points uh, for for either one of those. So trying to convince um, I don't know a, a traditional fund brief buyer that actually it's just as good as one of the Southern European um, covered bond issuers, unless. There's a structural change uh, again to what Antonio mentioned of some sort of a uh, some sort of a, a structural government support. I, I don't see this uh, this happening. So I don't think we are uh, overstating the importance of, uh, of of nuances and differences between different jurisdictions for the time being, at least. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Lucette, um, I said a weak bank in a strong country is better than a strong bank in a weak country. 
Uh, does that still does that still ring true for you? Well, I think considering the strength and the speed of the rally, I think investor more than ever are going to go fishing in potentially uh, what is perceived as weak economy, and um, that's the only way. Uh, to beat the market uh, to this um, extra strong rally. Um, obviously, there is consequences, and I think these consequences are now um, surfacing because we've seen quite a bit of um, shift in allocation between equity and fixed income. And uh, obviously, fixed income potentially lower rated asset and higher rated asset at a time where yield um, has compressed or is nearly um, all time lows, um, but um, all that is playing in the favor of um, covered bond and potentially covered bond from uh, country which are perceived with um, a lower rating. But that, that's the name of um, the investment. And I think um, as much as um, in previous crises, we had enough time to see a switch from um, um, high or low value asset to um, high quality asset and back into um, low value asset. I mean, here with compression for a reason that obviously we've mentioned in terms of ECB and local government supporting noticeably investment grade and also um, the covered bond market um, mean that um, people are potentially going to stick more to high quality asset and um, in the high quality asset covered bond. Um, play a special role. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this regulation uh, play out because, um, as most of you mentioned, obviously, we have seen more consolidation in terms of EU-wide um, blanket um, intervention scheme and resolution as well. And um, that probably means that, you know, um, COVID bond with a lower rating will compress um, further towards what maybe Antonio will say is um, a new average or a new normal. And um, I, I would be keen to pose um, to Antonio, where does he think that new normal will be of his average? Um, uh, how will it look like? Yeah, and Antonio, do you have anything to say to Lucette's question there? Uh, on, on, uh, on, on credit spreads, I, I, I think that uh, they reflect uh, also an overall uh, market sentiment, risk on, risk off. Um, uh, my answer uh, was focusing more on, uh, on credit risk. On credit risk, I believe that uh, they will still see very important differences between a cover bond issued uh, out of double B rated country or triple A rated country or something in between. Uh, regarding uh, uh, spread, obviously, uh, we, we, we know that uh, when there is more liquidity and the market is uh, more optimistic, we see that uh, differences tend to, to, to reduce, but also this is valid uh, on the cover bond spread versus senior secured. Uh, um, I don't think that they necessarily reflect all the time uh, different credit risk per se. Thank you. Um, so in my, I had a previous discussion with uh, with um, Luca and Baudouin um, and spoke, talking about the revival of the idea of using covered bond technology to fund loans to small and medium sized enterprises, um, ESNs, um, with full recognition of the practical problems involved in developing such an asset class. It does um, seem to be an appropriate way to fund the recovery. Um, Patrick, are you a believer in these things in the SN? Yeah, I like the idea. Um, however, um, I think there are, um, let's say, uh, different forms where you really can, let's say, uh, fund those. Um, um, Let's say assets. Um, um, it is. It could be. Let's say the TLG, or it could be securitization. It could be a lot of different. Let's say ways to 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 have. Let's say very competitive funding. And um, let's say if we if we compare it with let's say structured covered bonds, um, we have not seen a lot of difference in terms of pricing to the senior market. So. I guess it's a good idea, but um, I think um, let's say the let's say investor base or spectrum is not large enough at that stage to really 
let's say, get the uh, an advantage in terms of funding. So uh, I think it's a good idea, but uh, at the end, I think the target to get uh, cheaper funding and, and, and then, let's say, derive from that uh, and get an incentive to do uh, more, let's say, business, um, it's, uh, I think, hard to achieve at that stage. But that's my personal opinion. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lucet, what do you think about it sends? Something that you would like to look at? Sorry, what was the question? Yeah, so uh, really it was, we were talking about the revival of the idea of using um, covered bond technology to fund loans to small and medium sized enterprises. So ESNs, um, yeah. do you like them as, a, as an asset if you like, or would you prefer to ignore them? Yeah, I think they, they, um, they are fantastic asset class and they definitely service um, a number of asset allocation um, going forward, noticeably for a um, multi-asset um, type of player. I mean, with the um, low yield, low um, income base that we have in a number of asset class, noticeably in investment grade, SSA, government and so on, we're going to have to seek um, yield elsewhere. Otherwise, um, our pensioners are never going to retire and our insurance company are never going to be um, supporting any claims. So. Um, I do believe um, in supporting the economy down into um, the root of um, where things are happening. And I think these ESN um, notes are clearly um, a great way to further how the support to um, domestic European and um, local citizen in many different ways. Um, I, so I can you, buy them. Them. You, you would buy them from where you sit? Yeah, so um, so we will apply the same rules as uh, we apply for any of our credit. We will look at you know the repayment mechanism, um, the business that's supporting, um, and so on. And then once our um, credit expert have um, has as the qu uh, the quality um, of this note, there's no reason to think we wouldn't invest. So yes, um, I think it, it's a fantastic idea. Okay, thank you. Um... I'd like to move on to our last question, um, and um, um, it's regarding um, green covered bonds. Um, so at this event, everyone wanted at this event last year, I should say, uh, everyone wanted to talk about green covered bonds, uh, and we have a few sessions on this very topic on the agenda over the next couple of days. But um, starting with you, Antonio, do you think? that the green cover bond concept is on hold while we sort this coronavirus mess out? Or is it still going on in the background? Or, or do you think actually we need to seriously rethink green covered bonds? I, I think that it is still going on. And uh, I have to say that uh, I'm even more optimistic now than at uh, the very beginning of the year, because uh, uh, when uh, the situation is, is, uh, is, is stable, uh, it's it's easier to, to pay lip service to a lot of uh, nice initiative. But uh, when a crisis this is uh, this this big hits the economy. Then uh, you you can see where politician and the society at large uh, is uh, is really interested. And uh, we've seen uh, other major uh, uh, economies that uh, they have relaxed, for example, their uh, environmental regulation, or they start investing again in uh, uh, coal uh, produ production of uh, coal energy with uh, coal using coal. While uh, in uh, in the case of the European Union. Union, uh, um, rightly so, authorities have uh, prioritized uh, uh, the, the the COVID crisis and, and the recovery, but uh, they always kept the, the, the green uh, dossier open. And uh, we see that uh, as part of the EU recovery fund, uh, they, they, they want uh, sustainability to play a, a very important role. So I think that uh, this is really reassuring and uh, this yeah. is uh, make me quite optimistic for the future and also let's remember that uh, in november there are elections on uh, the other side of the pond so we may or not have uh, an administration that is uh, closer to these uh, themes and arguably if the eu and the us uh, are uh, moving together uh, uh, to pursue a green objective then uh, this could be a very strong incentive for the other big economies such as china and the future uh, india 
Uh, thank you, Patrick. You're you're sitting there with a, a screen behind you saying "committed to green." So, uh, it seems an entirely appropriate question to ask you as well. So, um, yeah, w w what's happening with green covered bonds? Um, you, is it is it something that's taken a back seat while we deal deal with this crisis, or uh, what, what have you seen? No, I I, I definitely don't think it's uh, it's uh, it's deprioritized. Um, well, as you can see. Uh, LBW is committed to green. Uh, green uh, or sustainable sustainability is one of the, let's say, core strategies of LBW uh, since decades. Uh, and um, um, uh, you're right, Antonio. I think uh, in a crisis you have to prioritize first of all. Uh, but um, uh, I think not only in the banking community but also politicians, uh, regulators uh, saw that uh, let's say. Um, uh, um, a growth cannot be, let's say, um, a, a compromise built uh, with, with uh, sustainability. So sustainability uh, stays a very uh, important uh, task. Uh, and also the pace of the, of the regulators uh, with the EU taxonomy, with the d discussion um, uh, in the EBA for, uh, let's say, green uh, supporting factor, etc. The, the, all the discussions are ongoing. And uh, bonds, or in this case, covered bonds, uh, uh, contribute uh, uh, to this, uh, let's say, um, uh, let's say, decarbonization path uh, 2030, 2050. Um, I think uh, it's absolutely not deprioritized, especially for LBW. It stays one of uh, a very important uh, tasks we, we follow uh, with uh, very high priority. And, um, um, and uh, um, yeah, I think uh, the, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a question of, of growth uh, on, on, on the real estate side, especially on the commercial real estate side and uh, also on, uh, on the residential real estate side. But um, um, besides, let's say, fully built um, energy efficient buildings, you have, uh, let's say, one sector which is very crucial um, to um, uh, uh, let's say to to further push this, uh, let's say green bonds or green cover bonds, which is uh, refurbishments. And um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it I think uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's following the same page uh, pace as as it uh, um, uh, as it was before the crisis. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Marco, how about you? Yeah, had, had you asked me this question actually before, Patrick, I was going to say, well, we have an issuer on the panel, so let's uh, let's hear what the issuer has to say about it. Uh, so, no, jokes aside, um, I, I definitely am not hearing actually from the whole, well, my my client base, I'm not hearing that actually anyone is putting it uh, on, on a back burner, so to say. Yes, obviously, the current uh, uh, crisis uh, is at the forefront of everyone's minds as to what uh, what they should be focusing on. Um, but away from the from the green and energy efficient uh, uh, space, I think uh, uh, the space that more and more people actually are, are starting to to think about is the governments and the social aspects of the ESG platform. Um, so we see actually which way the world is moving, um, and actually I'm a big uh, I'm a big supporter of uh, especially the ones that are developing all sorts of internal projects focusing on the governance and uh, uh, and and uh, and the social aspects of uh, of, of housing especially. Um, so this 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 is the future. Yeah, I mean, Lucette, I think you mentioned I think um, earlier on in our conversation um, how markets or people have become a bit more sort of socially aware. Was that what you meant? I think. And and how do you think cover bonds can play a role in this? Um, I definitely think that um, it's no longer a hot topic um, of discussion. It's a reality for most investors. It is a reality for most regulators. Um, trustees, um, insurance company, obviously bank have um, to uh, publish a number of different metrics um, reporting on, you know, environmental, social and um, governance on an ongoing basis. And I think obviously the fund management industry, including Fidelity, have a big role to play, both in terms of awareness, in terms of setting up the standard and the measure. Uh, but also um, proposing more solutions which are more sustainable in the long run um, and which um, would create better society. So I think the COVID bond is definitely part of it. Um, I definitely welcome 
more issuance and also I think um, an uplift of a standard throughout the industry through obviously the exceptional high quality covered bond part of the um, bank capital but also um, going all the way down um, probably to equities and um, I think Fidelity will have um, a big role to play with a number of products being either converted or being um, issued fresh in the most sustainable family. Thank you. Well, um, I think we've come to um, a suitable end uh, of, our, of our discussion. Thank you very much, um, Patrick, Antonio, Lucette and Marco. Thank you very much. Um, it's been fantastic. And now uh, we can look forward to some questions from our audience. But thank you very much.